I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who's in recovery for the effects of childhood sexual abuse. I struggle with depression, anxiety, self-harm, and codependency. My name is Bonnie. Bye. Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I was born on January 8th, 1984, the day before my mom's 29th birthday, and four years, 364 days after she had her tubes tied. I really wanted to be here. <laughs> I'm the youngest of three and the product of my mom's second marriage. My brother is seven years older than me, and my sister is four years, 364 days older than me. Their father was an abusive alcoholic, and my mom divorced him shortly after my sister's third birthday. I was abandoned before I was even born. I have never met my biological father. When my mom was eight months pregnant with me, she learned that my dad was a drug addict, so she gave him two choices, you leave or the drugs leave. He walked away and never looked back. Despite this, I had a relatively normal childhood. When I was two, I was baptized in and started attending a mainline denominational church. I'm not entirely sure why, because my mom was raised in an evangelical church. My brother and sister's grandmother would pick my brother's sister and I up every Sunday for church for the next three years. The God I learned about in that church was kind of scary. I knew I didn't want to get on his bad side. When I was five, I started attending my mom's denomination. And when I was eight, I told the pastor that I wanted to be baptized. I was so happy the Sunday that he baptized me. It was one of the few times that my mom and stepdad came to church. I was about two years old when my mom met and moved in with my stepdad. They got married right after I turned nine. Growing up, we didn't have a lot of money, but we got by. I enjoyed barrel racing and playing softball. I also played in my church's handbell choir, and when I was old enough, I got involved in school athletics, 4-H, and band. From the outside looking in, I had a pretty good life, but I was keeping a secret from everyone, even my family. My stepfather was sexually abusing me. It happened almost weekly over a course of eight years. He never once threatened me, but instead told me how much he loved me. I never told anyone because my mom was happy, but more than that, he had plans to adopt me and I so desperately wanted a father. I was 13 when I decided that I had enough and I could no longer live with this secret. We were at the place we called our homestead. My stepfather was a hunter and kept loaded guns in that house. I knew I needed to run, but I was terrified. Finally, I got up enough courage that I was able to get up and start running. I didn't look back even though I could hear him chasing me. When I got to the road, I just stood there, crying hysterically. I hadn't gotten this far in my plan, and my house and my mom were on the other side of town. My theater teacher happened to live next door, so I ran to her house and banged on her door. When she opened it, I ran inside, told her why I ran, and she called my mom for me. I know that I'm lucky, because when I told my mom the truth, she put her hands on my shoulders and told me how proud she was of me. I didn't have the heart to tell her it happened more than once. We didn't go home that night or ever again. Living in such a small town, and my old house being right across the street from my school, all of my friends knew that I was no longer living at home. When they asked me why my parents split up, I simply told them that they had gotten to a huge fight, but I didn't know what, else, what it was about. At 13, I didn't really know what else to say. On May 27th, 1997, two months after I told her he had abused me, my stepfather murdered my mom. She died saving my life. My stepfather came to us, asking my mom to come back to him, and she told him no. My stepfather shot her in the parking lot of a grocery store. The last words my mom said to me were, run, Bonnie, run. I don't remember much from the days following her death. It all went by so fast. All I wanted to do was sleep, but no one would let me. I don't remember crying. I sat in the back of the church at her funeral, and I refused to go to her burial. My stepfather turned, him in, turned himself in several hours after my mom died and was eventually tried and convicted for murder and attempted murder. He was then sentenced for two consecutive life sentences. Two days after my mom's funeral, I moved away from the little town I had lived my entire life. I moved in with my aunt and uncle whom I barely knew. 
They had two kids of their own, and I went from being the very spoiled baby of the family to the middle child and the only girl. My aunt is a very devout Christian and made sure I attended church every week. I thank her for this now, but back then I really resented it. I knew God existed, but I didn't think he cared about or loved me. And if I'm being honest, I hated him. The people at my aunt's church all knew what just happened to my family and would constantly tell me how sorry they were for me. I didn't want anyone feeling sorry for me. On July 27th, 1997, exactly two months after my mom died, my aunt sent me to a Christian camp, Camp Lone Star in LaGrange, Texas. I told myself that I was not going to have fun and I did a pretty good job of doing just that. <laughs> I only spoke when I was spoken to and I never let on how much I was hurting. No one but the camp director knew what I had just gone through. One evening, the girls in my cabin were sitting out by the lake just chatting about life. Our counselor told us to grab a rock as big as one of our problems, find a place to sit and pray about it, and then when we were ready, give the problem to God and throw the rock in the lake. I tried really hard to hold it in, but I started shaking and then I broke down crying. This was about eight years worth of crying. All the pain I'd been keeping inside just spilled out. I looked at the counselor and said, there isn't a rock as big as my problem. And she simply hugged me. I told her how my mom died, and she didn't try to comfort me by saying everything was going to be okay. She just held me tighter. The day after I confided in my counselor and let her get close to me, she got hurt and had to go to the emergency room to get stitches. This is when I began to believe that I was cursed. It seemed like everyone I let in my life got hurt. First my mom, then my counselor. The list got longer as the years went on. I began to build up a wall around me and would not let anyone come in. It seemed that if I let people get close to me, they would pay a price. Everyone kept telling me how strong I was. I was told by many well-meaning adults, when I grow up, I wanna be like you. But I was only strong because it seemed like that's what everybody expected of me. Inside though, I was hurting so much. I had this constant pain in my chest, like my heart was always breaking. In high school, I kept myself so busy that I didn't have time to think about the pain of my childhood. Before the school year started, I had volleyball, followed by basketball, softball, and track. On top of my school extracurricular activities, I played on a year-round softball team, did both dance and tumbling, was in my church's handbell choir, and was a leader for my high school youth group. I was usually out of the door by 5.30 a.m. and didn't return until around 6.30 p.m. at the earliest. That left time for homework, dinner, and bed. It was the summer before my senior year that I started to self-harm. I was at camp and I carved three crosses into my right ankle. The pain I constantly had in my chest left just for a little bit. I finally discovered an outlet for my pain without letting anyone know that I was actually in pain. For a long time, I would only cut my ankles. It was easy to hide. No one noticed, and if they did, they pretended not to. I was accepted to and started attending Concordia University at Austin in 2002. I was going with the intent to become a director of Christian education with minors in youth and family ministry and outdoor ministry. The pain I started getting in my chest in high school was 10 times worse in college because even though I had a full schedule, taking 18 hours of classes, 10 hours of work study, 10 hours of field work, and playing on Concordia's softball team, I found that in college, I still had a lot of free time. I wasn't in class all day long like I was in high school, and no matter how hard I tried, I could not keep my depression at bay. My chest hurt worse now, and cutting my ankles wasn't enough, so I started to cut the insides of my arms, but I was still able to hide it fairly easily. All of my friends were at least a year older than me, and I started going to parties with them. I didn't really drink, but sometimes I needed to forget everything and would allow myself to do just that. Though nothing happened, I stopped when I woke up in the bed of someone I didn't know. I stopped going to my classes because in my mind, all the other director of Christian education students had perfect lives. It just made me more depressed. I still turned in all of my assignments, but unless I was with my best friend, I was usually isolating in my room. The spring semester of my freshman year, my best friend's roommate invited me to a party. When we got there, she was making excuses as to why no one else was showing up. 
She, her boyfriend, and his roommate tried to get me drunk, and I was found out I was there because they wanted me to be a part of a sexual act. I refused, but the guys were stronger than me, and I was raped by both of them with my friend not only watching, but participating. The next day, I went to the movies with my attackers, and life went on like nothing ever happened. My advisor found out about my self-harm the fall semester of my sophomore year and required me to go talk to the school psychiatrist. Over Christmas break, I got a letter telling me that I needed to take the next year off to get counseling. My life was beginning to unravel. I went back to Austin to pack up my stuff and then headed home. I took a job as a lifeguard at a camp I had gone to as a young child. I told one person about my self-harm and was back to just cutting my ankle. We had a really small staff and we were all very close. One night while watching a movie with the staff, I found myself once again being sexually abused. I was in a room full of people and not one of them knew what was happening to me at that moment. So I did what I learned to do at the age of five and just attached myself. When he was done, I pretended like it didn't happen, walked to my room and went to bed. A little later that summer, I told my boss when asked, because this guy had been inappropriate with some of the other female staff. And I remember him being so angry at me that I never told him what happened. He let me know this guy would have been fired. I looked my boss in the eye and told him, this is not the first time it's happened to me. When I was little, I told I was being abused and my mom died. I was not going to be the cause of anyone else getting hurt. I still cannot comprehend why it kept happening to me. I feel like I have this invisible sign hanging around my neck that these guys could see. I've already been abused. You can use me however you want. When I went back to Concordia, things were probably worse than when I left. I had finally started getting along with my aunt and, uh, my aunt, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was terrified I was going to lose my other mom. I was so angry with God, I remember telling him, if she dies, we're done. I stopped functioning. I isolated myself in my bedroom and only left when absolutely necessary. I moved back home for another year and worked at my aunt's daycare. I enrolled for classes at the local community college, but I couldn't bring myself to show up. I was so severely depressed, it took everything to just pretend to be functioning. It never seemed okay with my aunt that I was depressed. I just needed to trust God and everything would be okay. Lying about how I was doing turned out to be a lot easier than I thought it would be. French author Francois de la Rufoucou said, we are so accustomed to disguise ourselves to others that in the end we begin to disguise, our, we become disguised to ourselves. This quote described me perfectly for the next several years. Many people I've met in Celebrate Recovery got into the program because something traumatic has happened to get them here. Although I have had my share of traumatic events and they are the reason I'm in recovery, it wasn't any one event that got me into Celebrate Recovery. It was just a discussion about a book. I was hanging out with some friends, watching a University of Texas basketball game, and she asked if I had ever read it. I told her I had, but it was hard because it hit so close to my personal life. Apparently in the four years I had known her, I never mentioned anything about my past to her. What followed was an awkwardness that usually follows when people find out about my childhood. We dropped the subject since we weren't in a good place to talk in depth about it. But when I got home that night, I sent her a big chunk of my story. Her response was six words. Have you heard about Celebrate Recovery? <laughs> She met me before a large group the first week I went and told me what to expect. She came with me to large group for a month until I was comfortable enough to come by myself. I usually sneaked in about 10 minutes after large group had started so I could come in unnoticed. My small group later, leader later told me that she knew I was sharing because she could see my mouth moving, but she had no idea what I was saying because she couldn't hear anything coming out. Not long after starting Celebrate Recovery, I was invited to go to the leadership summit with some of our leadership team. When we got to California, I started to isolate from the rest of our group. I put in my headphones, turned my music up, and kept to myself. Seeing these thousands of people who have been helped by this program actually really discouraged me. I remember thinking there wasn't hope for me like there was for the rest of the people at this conference. 
my pain was too big for Celebrate Recovery. I was ready to call it quits. Luckily, I had a friend who was there with me, who sat outside the hotel with me late one night and helped me talk my feelings out. She then so lovingly drilled in my head, don't give up, keep working the steps. I promise there is hope, you will heal. I wish I could say that it stuck the first time, but it didn't. She had to drill this into my head many, many times. And I'm so thankful that she did because I did continue to do my steps and I do have hope. I follow the 12 steps for survivors of abuse. Step one for me was walking into my step study group for the first time. I admitted I was powerless over the past and as a result, my life had become unmanageable. Living as if everything was okay wasn't really working for me. And it was a huge step for me to admit that I wasn't okay because no one had ever let me do that. Doing my fourth step, I made a searching and fearless moral inventory of myself, realizing all wrongs could be forgiven. I renounced the lie that the abuse was my fault. This was a hard but healing step in my recovery process. While doing my inventory, I realized that for the past 12 years, I blamed God for my abuse and I blamed God for my mom's murder. I blamed myself for my abuse and I blamed myself for my mom's murder. But for the past 12 years, I had let my stepfather off the hook. I never once made him take responsibility for his actions. With my sponsor's help, I was able to write not guilty for my part I didn't know how much I resented God or myself until I did my inventory. I know I have hurt a lot of people by keeping them at arm's length, but I discovered the patterns of why I did this. Step nine states, we extend forgiveness to ourselves and to others who have perpetrated against us, realizing this is an attitude of the heart, not always confrontation. Make direct amends asking forgiveness from those people we have harmed, except to do so would harm them or others. On May 28, 2009, we had our forgiveness lesson in large group. I made a decision on this night, one that I never imagined I could do, one that I could not have done without the help of God. I forgave my stepfather. Yay. I wrote him a letter a few days later telling him that I had hated him for so long but with the help of God, I had forgiven him. I said on the letter a couple of months, but I finally sent it to him at the place where he was currently serving time. It was healing for me and I pray it was the same for him. I'm glad I was able to take the step before he passed away in jail in July of 2011. Forgiving my stepfather was not a one-time deal. I'm having to constantly ask God to help me forgive him, but every time it gets easier. Working the forgiveness lesson in my step study, I was finally able to start forgiving myself and realized I needed to work on forgiving God. I'm working on forgiving my other attackers as well, and I'm letting God begin to take that pain from me. More recently, I've opened the door to forgiving my biological father for abandoning me. Though I do not have a relationship with him, and I'm still working on a deep hurt that I never knew was there, this step has opened up new relationships with family I didn't even know I had. I'm beginning to build relationships with two older sisters and an older brother that I didn't know existed. I'm also getting to know my many aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, and cousins on my dad's side who really want to get to know me and make it a point to let me know they love me. I still struggle. I'm nowhere near where God wants me to be, but I'm working on it, and I trust God more now. I still get angry with him, but he is a big God, and he holds me close when all I want to do is beat his chest with anger, fear, and frustration. And when I'm spent, he lets me cry on his shoulders. I know he cares for me, and I now take to heart the verse I chose for my confirmation. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age, Matthew 28, 20. Before, before Celebrate Recovery, my automatic response when I was hurting was to control my pain in one of two ways, 
just pretend I wasn't hurting or control my pain by hurting myself. I have 14 tattoos and all of them have significant meaning to me, but I got most of them at times when I was really hurting and in need of release. Someone once told me, as much as you like to hide your pain, you wear it all over. I have an amazing support team, and when I do feel like I want to fall into my old ways of coping, they're just a phone call away. My first Celebrate Recovery meeting was February 5th, 2009, and I am so glad I walked through the doors that night. I have not cut in four years and eight months. I still struggle with depression and wanting to self-harm, but I now have ways to keep Satan's lies at bay. In Celebrate Recovery, you will hear the saying a lot, don't quit before the miracles happen. Specifically to the newcomer, I encourage you to stay, share with us your hurts and your struggles, your hopes and your achievements. In turn, let us share our hurts and our struggles, our hopes and our achievements. Let us walk with you because though you may not see it now, there is a light up ahead, and with it comes a peace that you may have never felt before. I'm not saying that you're no longer going to hurt and you're no longer going to struggle, but if you choose to share with us, you will have people who care about you that will hold your hand and be there with you when you are. Find a way to give back. I currently work as a supervisor in a tech support branch of my company. I have to travel some and it keeps me pretty busy. But Matthew 10, eight says, freely you've received, freely give. I honestly believe the more that you give back, the more you will get out of Celebrate Recovery. Yeah. Work your 12th step. <laughs> My favorite way to serve and Celebrate Recovery is serving the teens. When the landing came out, I looked at our ministry leader and I told him, we are going to do this and I am going to lead it. <laughs> we are finishing up our fifth year in three weeks and it continues to be the thing that I love the most. I can abs be absolutely exhausted, but when I walk through the doors to start setting up on Thursday evening, it's like none of the rest matters. I love seeing the changes in my teens as they continue to come back. I am so passionate about this program because when I was 13, I needed this program and I didn't have it. And I think it could have kept me from making choices that I look back at now and feel so ashamed from. The teens I see coming through this program teach me so much and help me continue to grow. It's true what they say, God never wastes a hurt. I also have the pleasure of serving as the South Central Landing Rep, and I enjoy helping get this amazing program started with other people's CRs. I'm gonna close today with my favorite Bible verse that I feel sums up God's redemption story in my life. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. What is now being done, the saving of many lives. Genesis 50:20. Thanks for letting me share.